My name is Miguel Rocha. I'm here from UCI. And I want to start by thanking my collaborators. And I want to continue with changing my uh, title a little uh, slightly. Um, Cosmological simulations with self-interacting CDM, of just cosmological simulations with self-interacting dark matter. And the reason is that I really want to pass the message that this is called dark matter, and as such, it comes with all the good things that coldness brings. Uh, right structure, right cluster, right abundances of halos. Uh, all these large kill properties that we have been able to verify uh, observationally have made us fall in love with a standard CDM. Um, however, I just want to remind you that all these properties, properties we owe it to it just being cold. And as such, uh, one may wonder what else can we add uh, to this property of being cold without observation, without battling observational bounds. Um, from the uh, particle physics point of view, adding self-interactions is really well motivated. Uh, first of all, uh, dark matter self-interactions as strong as the standard model, as strong interactions are allowed by primordial nucleosynthesis. Uh, probably you all have heard about the WIMP miracle. Uh, well, particle physics uh, use this term to remind us that you don't really need a WIMP. Uh, this term, the WIMPless miracle, uh, uh, just to remind us that you don't really need a WIMP to um, get the right uh, cosmological abundances of dark matter. Uh, Self-interactions are a generic consequence of hidden sector extensions to the standard model. Um, even if dark sector particles have no couplings to the standard model particles, they may experience strong interactions with themselves via dark gauge back. Gauge bosons. Uh, so if that, this was the case, we wouldn't ever be able to know that dark matter self-interaction by anything by other than uh, its astrophysical effects. Uh, from the astrophysical point of view, uh, self-interactions uh, are interesting because they are a, a method to reduce the lowers, to lower the central densities and form constant density cores in dark matter halos, and to reduce the number of uh, subhalos. Uh, through subhalo evaporation. Uh, this was first point by Spergel and Steiner in 2000. And as such, it was uh, really promising because uh, the uh, missing satellite problem was really fresh and we already knew about the cusp core problem. Uh, so people jumped right on board and tried to constrain this model through our web. Uh, the result was kind of sad. Uh, just to summarize here, uh, the results were that uh, if you want to form cores on dwarf galaxies, uh, you will need uh, self-interaction cross-sections uh, too large that will form too large cores in, uh, in clusters of in cluster halos uh, to be compatible with observations. Uh, furthermore, Miralda Scudder uh, set a constraint based on halo shapes uh, with, of a self-interaction cross-section very low, 0.02. Too, uh, with, you basically wouldn't be able to do anything with this. Uh, however, I could tell you a problem with every single one of these constraints, but I'm not going to get into those details. All I want to tell you is that, for example, the stringent of these constraints, uh, the Miralda's constraint, uh, is off by two orders of magnitude. And this is demonstrated by Annika Peer all through our simulations. And this is out in the archive listing as of today with my paper. These two are companion papers. Uh, we study halo shapes in Peter et al. And, uh, everything else that I'm going to show you in Roche et al. Um, so based on this, we decide to go ahead and revisit the simplest self-interacting model. It's elastic, velocity independent. Uh, let me back up a little bit. So based on, on the problems here, people start suggesting a velocity uh, dependent cross-section that will be stronger in um, in dwarf galaxies and not as, with low velocity dispersions and not as strong in cluster halos that with high velocity dispersions. But anyway, since we found there's problems here, we decide to go ahead with the simplest model, uh, velocity depend independent cross-section, elastic scattering, and isotropic scattering. And so for this model, there's only one free parameter. Uh, the uh, scattering rate is determined by uh, the cross-section per unit mass, uh, the densities, and the velocity dispersion. Uh, so through the talk, I'm going to refer to this cross-section per unit mass as sigma, sigma sub n, sigma m. I tend to mix it. I just refer to the same thing. There's only one knob in these simulations is this cross-section per unit mass. Okay, and so we 
went ahead and revisited um, um, those cross sections that seem to be ruled out already. Um, okay, so and the other the other reason why we wanted to uh, revisit these cross sections is that we have a brand new algorithm, self consistently derived from the Boltzmann equation. And I'm not going to get into details. All I want to say is that we have tested something that hasn't been done before for the previous work. Um, and we test not only the, scat the scattering rate, but we also test uh, the kinematic, uh, the scattering kinematics. Um, so we go ahead and run this model. Uh, well, we, uh, I implemented this on Gadget 2 and the publicly available version of Gadget 2. And our initial simulation set, from which we base all the results presented here, are two uh, full box simulations, one with 50 megaparsec over H volume, the other one with 25 and two some in halos, uh, one with 5 times 10 to 11 solar masses, real mass, and the other one, a Milky Way-like halo one, uh, with a mass of 1 times 10 to 12. Um, so we run all this with uh, sigma of over m of uh, 1, CD, so basically CDM, um, of 0, 1, and 0.1. So CDM, 1, and 0.1. Um, so for the large scales, as uh, one would expect, uh, we find no difference at all. Uh, this visualization shows uh, uh, 50 by 50 by 10 megaparsec slice of our 50 megaparsec box. Uh, on the left is lambda CDM, on the right is standard CDM, uh, I mean it's uh, SIDM with sigma of 1. And of course, uh, visually, there's no difference at all. In a more quantitative way, we are uh, plotting here the um, Bmax function, number of halos as a function of Bmax, uh, and solid is CDM, standard CDM, and dash is SIDM of one. And we don't see any difference uh, even for uh, height redshift. Okay, however, if one looks at individual halo scales, uh, you can see that. There is, this is color code by phase space density. Um, and one can see that there is lower phase space density for uh, SIDM halos uh, than for uh, standard CDM. And a little bit rounder, uh, probably with this slide you can't really see. Uh, but SIDM halos tend to be a little bit rounder. But just at the core centers, and not by much. And this is basically the assumption that maybe all this could be off by two orders of magnitude and their. Uh, on their um, constraints. Uh, another thing I wanted to see here is that uh, the subhalo look quite similar. You, uh, you could, you know, barely you can see here, but all, all subhalos are there, uh, except for in the very centers, you can start like seeing a few that are missing. Uh, and I'm not more quantitative way, we're plotting uh, the subhalo Vmax function here for, uh, whoa. Okay, let me. Got it. Okay, the subhalo Vmax function uh, for a few halos um, in our simulations. And you can see that the suppression of subhalos is actually rather mild. Um, there's a trend uh, halos with. Uh, Lower masses uh, have less of a suppression than halos with higher masses. Um, okay, solid is uh, CDM, uh, dash is uh, SIDM of one, and dotted lines is SIDM of 0.1. Uh, so basically, for 0.1, you don't see any suppression. Uh, and also, if you look at the inner parts uh, inside 0.5, uh, inside the 0.5 real uh, radius, uh, then you see a little bit more of the suppression. Uh, but in general, uh, we find that uh, SIDM doesn't really uh, remove the mass of halos, and this is a good thing. It's something we have learned from Shams and, uh, uh, and from Sloan is that we need this substructure there. Um, so I want to continue by showing uh, a, few, a few density profiles of um, what happened in the center of halos. Um, so here in this plus on the, on the left, I have uh, our 10 to 12 halo, and on the right, a cluster-like halo, 2 times 10 to 14. And solid, well, black is CDM, uh, 
green is sigma of 0.1 and blue is sigma of 1. Uh, solid black is the N of W fits, and dash blue is our Burker fits to the sigma of M, sigma over M of 1. Uh, we don't fit uh, anything to the results of sigma of M of 0.1 uh, because basically uh, they're not good fits. Anything that we try is not a good fit. The reason that Burker profiles are a good fit for sigma of M of 1 is that uh, the scale at which interactions are, uh, become important uh, is similar to the scale radius of the halo. So you can describe these halos with a single scale for sigma of 1. But for, this is not a general result for any cross-section, because basically for this problem you have two scales. One is associated with the structure collapse, uh, which is the scale radius of the uh, of NFW. Uh, and the other one is the scale at which um, interactions become important. So I want to show you the velocity dispersion profiles, because the formation of core is a result of uh, halos becoming isothermal. Uh, basically, within the region at which interactions become important, the halos are becoming, uh, the interaction side isotropizing uh, the velocity dispersion and exchanging energy. And so this makes uh, the velocity dispersions to, uh, to be a transfer of energy from, you start with a very cold uh, velocity dispersion profile in the inner regions with CDM, and you turn on interactions and trans, uh, there's transfer of energy. In, and so you start and you get an isotropic, uh, I mean, uh, isothermal velocity dispersion profile. And the place at which the, this start happening is just dependent on the, uh, the cross-section. Um, as you can see, uh, for sigma m of, sigma m of 0.1, uh, it just happens uh, a smaller radius. And this is just happening with the average part, um, in average particles will uh, experience one interaction. So basically, when the scattering rate is equal to the whole time, approximately of the for formation of the halo time. Um, so from this, from everything that is on these slides, I'm not gonna get into details, but from everything that is on these slides, we are able to build an analytical model that describes everything, uh, all the results that we find in our simulations, and so we can go beyond what our resolution uh, allows us to explore. Uh, so this for our results in the simulations of uh, sigma one, and you can see that uh, this is this, uh, the core radius as a function of Helm uh, Bmax. And you can see that a single power lag holds all the way. Uh, for, the central velocity, for the central density, you, there's not a clear trend, as, as clear of a trend. Uh, but this is probably just because um, we don't have as, uh, we need more resolution data. I mean, more um, uh, simulation data. Uh, but what I wanted to get from here is that it's, there is a scatter of both in core radii and core densities. And this is a good thing. If this model had to be taken serious as uh, alternative solutions for observations, uh, we see a scatter in observations. So this scatter is a good thing. Uh, so let me just flash through um, uh, the comparison to observations really quick. Uh, just if we compare to um, core sizes of clustered low mass spires and Milky Way dwarfs, uh, we find that there is some tension for sigma one, um, but you cannot completely rule out uh, that model. Uh, however, um, it is uh, for sigma of 0.1, uh, it looks everything okay. If you look at the central densities, it, there's a bit more of a tension for sigma of, of one, so we decide, we, we find that we can rule out this model just by the central densities of all scales, pretty much. But for 0.1, uh, it is all okay, and uh, if you know if these central densities, for especially for Milky Way dwarfs, uh, are compatible, then this solves uh, the too big to fail problem. So, do I still have time? Or? No. Okay, I'm way over, so I'm just gonna leave you my conclusions. Uh, all right. um,